All right, so I'm gonna have to get better at this because I just recorded a video <laughs> and then deleted it. Uh, we're getting better. If you don't know, this is JFace Games. Uh, what I'm doing is I am building a new RPG and as I'm building it, I'm taking you through the process and we're looking at a lot of other RPGs and board games and trying to see what we can borrow, uh, what we like about those and therefore we can take and we can add into our game. One of the things I also did was you know, I originally laid out the things that I like in a game, and I added a new one. I added surprises in play. And what this means to me is that the rules aren't so bound that you know exactly what everything does, meaning that the rules add um, flexibility and kind of fun in that sense. Um, as an example, I was playing 5e. I was a bard. I think I was like third level, maybe first level. and. Uh, I was on a bridge, didn't have any rails, huge long bridge. We were fighting these griffin riders. They were down, you know, they jumped off their mounts and they're fighting us. And my DM was awesome at being able to roll with the punches. And I had a uh, cantrip minor illusion. In essence, I could create a, my, a, an illusion that was about like a box by box. And so what I did was um, I kind of scared this griffin rider and then I made it look like over the edge, box by box, I made a griffin, but I tried to convince him that perspective-wise that it was his griffin, just lower. And what happened was I was able to convince him, he jumped to jump onto his griffin, went straight through my illusion, and the rest is history. But it was a great moment, and it added a lot of fun surprise to the uh, scenario. Now, some of that's just role-playing, but I don't want the rules to be so locked in that it's like, you feel like you have to do exactly what the rules say. So there's that. Now today what game we're talking about, or on this video what we're talking about is Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Um, so let's just dive right into it. So the first thing I wanna say is that the action economy. Three actions. So for those of you who haven't played, or maybe you played Pathfinder 1st Edition, 2nd Edition is very different. And one of the first things it does, which is really cool, is it has this three action economy. So there's a lot of D20 systems that have, you have a standard action and a movement and then maybe something like a free action or a bonus, or you have major and minor actions in essence and a movement. And so in essence, it's, it's these categories of actions and maybe you have one of each category, whereas in, action, in the action economy in Pathfinder, second edition, they've pretty much just said, look, you've got three actions and it opens up a lot. Uh, because then you could say, I'm gonna move for three actions, or I'm gonna try and attack with three actions with my weapon, or I'm going to cast a spell. And what's really cool is that even the spells, I could cast a heal, and depending on if I use one action, two actions, or three actions, that heal does something different. I use one action, I touch someone and it heals them. Two actions, I do a direct heal on a friend who's in distance. Three, I do a POB or PBAOE type heal. So it's really cool because I think it adds some choice and I love choice in a game um, as long as it doesn't slow the game down that I'm you know, burning my brain a little bit too much trying to make the perfect turn. But I love the way it kind of frees you up in a way in terms of those actions, um, at least the way you can kind of perceive actions because everything's an action. Everything kind of falls into an action and I've got three of them. So I really like that. Um, they do uh, attack of opportunities are only for fighters. Um, what's cool about this is that I think it frees up combat a lot. Um, attacks of opportunities are very powerful and in a lot of games everyone has them. And the problem with that is that then people don't want to move. You know, you get into combat and then you're kind of stuck there unless you completely give up your entire turn to get away. And then the problem with that is that someone can just chase you and now you're, you know, so you're kind of locked in. I think that in, in Pathfinder, only the fighters have it. And I want to say like, if you went through the monster manual, only like five of the monsters in the entire monster manual have it. And so what that does is that it makes combat, gives the option to combat to be more fluid. Like you can move around the battlefield or you have to use like blocking and position to keep people from getting away as opposed to just, um, as long as I'm touching you now, you're screwed because I'm going to get an extra attack on you if you run away. Um, so I like that. It also makes fighters more badass because fighters in some games don't feel like fighters necessarily. Uh, this game, Pathfinder 2e, they feel like fighters. You feel like you've got, you know, an edge in melee combat, which I think is really awesome. 
Uh, critical rolls are just getting 10 over the AC. So in a typical D20 game, <clears throat> if you roll a 20, 5% chance on a, die, on a D20, uh, you're gonna get a crit, meaning you do like extra damage. That's usually what it is. It's usually massive damage. In Pathfinder, you just need to get 10 over what their AC is. So what does that mean? That means if they have an AC of 12, um, if I get a 22, and that's me rolling the dice with my pluses, that means I got a crit. So if they get an AC of 12, and I have a plus eight to attack, that means I could crit technically on a 14 or higher. So that can be awesome, because the other thing that happens is that now, it, once again, looking at the idea of teamwork, now if one person in the party is much better at being able to attack, uh, the rest of us might try and leverage his attack, give him bonuses, give him the opportunity to even get a higher plus to hit so that he can get a massive crit and give him a huge two-handed weapon. And it's just really neat because it starts to add in some teamwork. Um, now, if you're, the other thing that's kind of interesting is if you're aware of the concept of bound accuracy, which is in uh, like 5e has bound accuracy, where pretty much it means that whether you're first level or 20th level, the pluses to hit and the ACs don't drastically change too much, meaning that low level monsters, even though they might have low hit points, they still have a chance to hit you possibly, and it can still hurt. Pathfinder 2E and some other games like it, it is not that case. It It is your pluses to hit. I think it, I mean, it, I want to say my third level, my fourth level character right now in Pathfinder 2E um, he has a skill check bonus of like plus 11. So the pluses can get ridiculous. I think they can get up to like plus 30 when you're up in higher levels. And what that means is that with this, this critical rolls um, being just 10 over, that if I'm fifth level and I'm fighting a first level monster in 5e, yes, they have less hit points. So maybe I can kill things. You know, if I, if I roll well, I'm going to hit it. Maybe I could still miss. But if I roll well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really, you know, great, I can hit it and I can do hopefully good damage. In Pathfinder, if I'm fifth level and something's first level, I am going to crit the hell out of it most of the time, I would, I would assume. And if I'm 10th level and I'm fighting, you really start to get that feeling of like Dynasty Warriors, where you are someone who can mow through things if they're lower level than you, which can feel pretty heroic. Um, the other, the flip side is that if the DM still wants to bring, say, like orcs or goblins into a encounter with 10th level characters, that means that he's going to have to do a lot more work to raise their hit points, raise their ACs, figure out what that would be. Or he takes a 10th level melee monster and just reskins it, I guess. I guess you could do that too. Whereas in something that has bound accuracy, you can still use some monsters from previous levels and they can still do something all you have to do is maybe boost their hit points or something like that so but i like the idea of critical roles being the 10 over ac it just that teamwork aspect is really cool um weapon properties so what i really like about um this one is that there are a ton of them but i really like the idea that weapons matter the type of weapon matters there's a lot of games that, yes, there are weapon type damages like piercing versus slashing versus bludge, bludgeoning. But the second I get a magic weapon, now my mag my weapon does magical damage, and it's like those damage types don't matter anymore as long as I'm doing magical damage. Whereas in this system, first off, those damage types matter. Uh, there was an example like we were in a fight against skeletons, and there was a rogue who had a rapier piercing damage. The skeleton was resistant to rapier by like, I don't know, he had like resistance five, which meant that the first five damage did nothing or something. Because if you think about it, he's bones and you're trying to pierce and the, the, it's just going right between the ribs. And so this guy who had a magical rapier takes a stab at a, at a uh, um, skeleton and it was in fantasy grounds. And obviously he looks down and it says two damage. And he's like, what? And it was, all of us had to then realize like, oh crap. And meanwhile, we had this champion with a Warhammer and he hits it and it does like plus 10 damage. And, and so he was doing like 15 to 20 damage onto this one-hander. Um, 
So I like that. I like that weapon choice matters based on its weapon type. So maybe you bring a couple different things and you switch or you gotta know the, the monsters, etc. But then on top of that, you have all these properties that do little different things that are cool. Like for instance, deadly, normally if you crit, you do double the dice. So if I've got a D8 weapon, I get a crit, I now roll 2D8. If it's a deadly weapon, it's going to add another die of a type, depending on what it is deadly. So say it's deadly D10, like that's what it says on your weapon. If my weapon does a D8, I get a crit, I now do 2d8 plus a d10. So just little things like that are kind of cool. Um, there's all kinds of things. You can see all these different um, all these different uh, properties. And there's other properties from other games that we'll mention when we get to those games. But I like weapons having properties and making it so that it matters. And I like their weapon type damage mattering. I think that's important. What else we got? A robust feat system. So what does this mean? So in Pathfinder 2e, it's pretty much feats as everything. So you have a couple different types. You have ancestry, class, skill, and general. Oh. And so pretty much what happens is that when you're creating a character, it's all about your feats. It is all about what feat you have. Um, yes, your class has a couple features, like if you're a, a caster, spell casting is a feature, but how you customize that character is all about what feats you take and you can do feats based on your ancestry. So what your race is, you're gonna have different feats you can choose. What your class is, every level you're gonna have, or not every level, but you're gonna have different uh, feats that then are gonna customize how you play. Um, skills, so based on what skills you have, if, if you have intimidation, for instance, you wanna make that better, there are skill feats that now you're glaring intimidation. So now you can just look at someone and intimidate them and you don't need to um, be able to speak their language. You have general feats. So I like the idea that you're using, once again, you're, you're, you're taking a language and flattening it. Instead of having, you know, you're using features or this or that, it's, everything's a feat. You have all these feats, it's just they're different pools based on where they're coming from, but it's the same vernacular. So I like that. And I like the customization. I like the idea that you have all these different things. As long as it's not paralysis of analysis, as long as, once again, I want this system that we're creating to be um, low bar of entry, you should be able to in intuit what's going on. And I think this system is relatively intuitive, but um, that's just a, a consideration we'll need. Uh, raising a shield and a shield block. So in this game, what's really neat is that if you have a shield, it doesn't do anything for you unless you actually raise it and to raise it, it takes an action. So then, once I've raised it, I took an action to raise it, I raise it, and now it's giving me pluses to my AC. Um, now if someone hits me, it's not, if I want to, I can use my reaction to then reduce the damage. So why do I like this? It's not necessarily that I wanna take this and put it in the game, but I like the choices you're having to make. I love it when you have choices to make um, in how you're playing. And so the fact that You've got this three action economy. And yes, I have a shield, but it means nothing unless I want to spend an action to use it to help my defense. Because you have other games where you maybe have like, like 5e, you have dodge, which is really cool. But the problem with that dodge is that it takes up my major action, my standard action, major action, which means that I have to forego my actual attacks unless I'm a monk and I use a key point, you know, to do it. That means if I want to be super defensive, I've got to sacrifice everything. And that can that's too much. Whereas in this, I like it because, yes, it's only giving you a plus two, I think, maybe a plus three if you've got a big shield, but now maybe I attack and I move for my actions, my first two actions and my third action, I can say, okay, do I wanna help my buddy so that he can get a chance to hit more? Do I want to intimidate that bad guy so that he has less of a chance to hit? Do I want to defend myself? I'm gonna raise my shield up because I wanna make sure that I can block. And then having the reaction be a choice again where I'm having to make this choice. Am I gonna use my reaction now and try and do less damage against me from that enemy? Like, I like that. I like the idea of these choices you're making with the actions and your reactions or whatever you have. Critical specialization. Um, what this is is that all weapons fall in different types. 
So you've got blunt weapon, or you've got uh, like hammer weapons, slashing weapons, piercing weapons, or like, no, I'm sorry. You have like hammers, swords, flails, pole arms, those kind of groupings. And at some point in time, you can say that I'm gonna be a specialist in this group, meaning that when I get a crit, there's a new special benefit. So if it's like a hammer, like a two-handed hammer or like a one-handed hammer mace, and you hit someone, you get a crit, well now, if you're a specialist in that, maybe you push them or you knock them down. And if you have a slashing or like a sword, maybe when you do the sword, you actually cause a bleed on them or something when you get a crit. I like that. I like the idea that these weapons, I'm getting better with these weapons, they matter. The only caveat I'd have towards that is, would it take away from the idea of the weapon types? Meaning that I like that you want to use different weapons and I don't like when a game starts to yes it's there's a lot of choice to make but as you make choices you do less and less as a character in third edition that happened where i felt like i had all these choices in the world but by the end of it when my fighter was like a i don't know 10th level or something or 11th level he was doing one thing amazingly and so there was no there was no reason for me to do anything else and so i like when people still feel like they have reasons to do different stuff and so i'd be nervous about this just if if you did this now would you never want to use anything but that weapon type that you're specialized in uh for crits so that would be my only you know caveat uh multi attack penalty i want to put this in because we talked already a couple times about what different groups what different games do with when you decide to take multiple attacks we talked about it with 13th age we talked about it with open legends uh, with Open Legends and Savage Worlds. And what do they do in this game? Well, in this game, it's in essence, you have three actions. You can use those three actions to just do three attacks if you want. But uh, the problem is, is that your first attack is made, you know, normally. Your second time you attack, it's minus five. Your next time you attack, it's minus 10. So it's it can get pretty rough. Now, what's cool is there are different feats in the game that's now like you can use two of your actions to do this attack, and this attack is two attacks. But then your third action is now at your minus 10, not your minus five. So it boosts that second action to make it a little bit easier. So there's some cool feats that kind of play with this idea that this multi-attack penalty that's your base penalty, where it's, I can attack as many times as I want for my three actions, but I'm gonna get minuses and they get pretty rough. It plays with how bad those minuses are. Um, there are also a couple feats like if I'm two weapon fighting, it's like, or if there, it's, it's like the weapon has an agile property or something, it makes it so instead of being zero minus five minus 10, it's now like zero minus four minus eight. You know, so there's other ways to tinker with it. So I like it. I like the idea. I like how you play with it. I, I think some of the other ones are a little more simple. Like I think the um, Savage World one's a little more simple, but um, we'll see. We'll see what we like. Uh, ready in action. Um, I think this is in a lot of games that they have the ready in action. But what's cool about this one is that this time ready in action is because you have these three actions, it feels better. Um, because you can still do something offensive and then wait to do something else offensive as opposed to in other games because your attack is one action and movement is another action and then free action or something else is a third, usually you're having to ready your entire offensive potential when you do a ready action. Whereas in this one, you're readying a portion of your actions, which therefore you could still be doing offensive stuff, um, which can be pretty cool. Uh, so that's it for Pathfinder 2e. Um, once again, I'm, I'm trying to strip down to just the core stuff that I really love. There's a lot of stuff about Pathfinder I really like, but these are some of the core mechanics I really love. Um, and so next time, I believe we will be talking about... 5th edition. We're going to go into D&D 5th edition, um, which I also love. So, 5th edition we'll talk about next time. If you're new here, once again, subscribe follow, leave some comments. I'd love to hear what your people are thinking. Um, uh, just as we're moving forward, and especially when we get into more building the actual RPG, I'd love to hear your feedback and what you're saying. So take it easy, guys.